Hello, and welcome to EdTech Talks, continuing discussion of Dave Cormier's Learning in a Time of Abundance. This week, Chapter 3, How Abundance is a Problem for Learning. Dave covers everything from melting temperature of lead to bookbinding sources of truth, Danish castles, poorly cooked Brussels sprouts, and bulletproof pancakes. Whoa. I am Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Madrill, and I'm in Chicago, Illinois. This is John Schinker in Stowe, Ohio. And I'm Dave Cormier in Windsor, Ontario. And we want to apologize to all the viewers and listeners who tuned in at the regular time last week and this week. Uh, we've had some schedule shifting, uh, but we are glad to be back after a very mini hiatus to continue they're, discussing. They're a very baseball. patient bunch, Jeff. No. We really appreciate that. Super accommodating, and we really appreciate that. that. Just <laughs> to any complaints. No, no, no complaints. So no understanding. <laughs> All right, Jen, take us away. As you say, well, that, that this poses a problem for us because our notes were prepared, what, a, a week ago or so? <laughs> so it's like, what are you talking about? What's, what's going on? So with that, I'll probably just turn it right over to Dave to help us introduce the uh, the topic. But we did talk uh, a little bit about this in general um, terms a, a week or so ago, 10 days ago or so, or whatever it was. Um and this idea of abundance of information. And so really what this chapter from my take is um, talking about the real world implications of this um, information abundance. And so um, when, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off, Dave, talking to us about how an abundance of information um, results in kind of a lack of um, appreciation for nuance and increased in uncertainty. Sure, I'll take the uncertainty first. I think one of the things that information abundance has done for us is I, I would suspect shown us the uncertainty in the things that we already thought we knew. So in the before times, um, let's call them before the internet, um, information was hard to come by. It was scarce. It was something you had to go out and find. And it was very, it was way more convenient to put it into, a, I don't know, let's call it a book, those old fashioned things people don't do anymore. Um, and sort of capture it into one piece. And then you'd have that one thing that you would teach somebody and you'd have that person remember it because it was more useful for them to be able to remember and hold on to one thing than it was to try to grasp the nuance when you weren't didn't have access to it. Whereas now any given thing that comes up, I can get 37 opinions right away, <clears throat> right? I get all the different pieces and I'm not trained to handle that. I'm trained to find the right answer to my question and then go on about making decisions with the right answer. So all of that information leads to us understanding how uncertain a lot of the decisions people make actually are. So if you take a simple example, like what is the best food to eat? Um, you can inherit, actually, I'll give you an example from today. Don't iron taffeta is the wisdom that Bonnie inherited from her mother. So we were coming downstairs, we had this material of unknown origin that we have to get ready for the prom tomorrow. And so don't iron taffeta is the inherited wisdom we have. And then Ren and I are both on our phones doing random searches to try to both identify the material and then also decide what we can do about it. And so we have like 17 different ideas about how we can actually address this piece of material. So in one case, You've got the, here's the rule and you just follow it because you don't really understand the rule. All you can do is kind of go with it. And in the other case, you've got so many different sort of details that let's try not to burn the cloth and we'll do our best. But, you know, there's the, let's hang it outside and put it in the thing and do this other thing with it. It's it's overwhelming, right? So you, you can see that uncertainty in every single decision, right? And that's what abundance gives us. Yet you made a decision. What is the status of the taffeta? Well, it's not taffeta, I don't think. Uh, I'm pretty sure that taffeta is not something that really happens anymore. Um, it's a material from the 50s or 60s that involved some magical combination of lycra and a variety of other things, according to the internet. Again, lead, know, asbestos, those things. Did I need to know this? I right. did not. But you can't help it. You don't just get the information you want to get all of it. So, you know, the then the history of lycra comes up and then there's a conversation about whether or not that matches modern materials, all the while the skirt is not getting ironed, right? So, and this is this is the sort of implications of abundance. And I think that 
when we talk about learning, we tend to talk about these really formal structures and new kids these days do change. But to me, the really interesting conversation and, and really what the book is about is how does the pact impact us on a daily basis? And we had this, uh, this explosion today around whatever that material is, but it is iron now. Um, I have not looked at it closely because I don't really want to know. <laughs> it's going to get worn anyway, and it's tomorrow. So we have no choice in the matter. Um, so it looks like it's not as wrinkled. <laughs> and, um, we're going to go with that. Um, well, answer the question. Does that give you the. It does. It does. And I'm going to skip ahead. I don't even know if I have this in my notes, but I think it ties back to something we talked about a couple weeks ago is this idea of persistence. Um, because in, inherent in everything you just said, you have to want to stick with it to get your answer. Um, mm. And this does kind of lead into maybe a, a segue into the next things I wanted to talk about this idea of, well, that sounds overwhelming. So you know what, I'm just going to iron it. And if it doesn't work, <laughs> then we're going to have another a different kind of problem. Um, so you know, you can you can extend that through to think about schools with people learning and the persistence and, um, and challenges folks face, face now to get these right answers or the answers that will help solve a problem. So, you know, how does that all play in with, with learning and education? So I would argue the shortcuts, again, I'm using random dates. Well, I'll keep using random ones. 40 years ago, the shortcuts were made before they got to me. So somebody went, eh, taffeta, and said, eh, don't iron it. Without all the nuances that some professional at the time would have understood. Those things happened before they came to me, whereas now I have access to all of that nuance. I may not understand it. I probably will not understand it. Um, but then I'm stuck making a decision. So like you say, close your ears and just pick or leave it on the ground and go have a beer because I can't or whatever. Right. And so I think that when you look at the kinds of anxieties that people talk about and the sort of people's unwillingness to have a discussion, I think a discussion right now is exhausting. Like suddenly if you're going to bring something that I can comfortably not have to think about if you're bringing it into question you've done another one of those things that i'm now stuck trying to figure out and i think i don't think it's uh, a coincidence at all that we've had increasing sort of factionalism mm -hmm. at the same time that abundance has come along mm -hmm. like it's so much easier to not have to think about it when do you I think have we're also i'm sorry go ahead no please do you think we're also less likely to just accept the conventional wisdom that we've been told you know, are we more likely to say, uh, I've been told that I don't iron this, but I'm not sure that I believe that or that that's still relevant or, you know, does does the meat really have to be cooked to this temperature? Um, does someone really have you, to stick around to answer questions or can they just <laughs> leave the conversation? <laughs> Maybe we're going to get it. Hold that thought. He's going to. Oh, <laughs> I can't it see it your it's out of focus, but I have seen that book, so yeah. I know what it is. So this, this is, is his book of household management. It's actually referred to in the uh, in the book. This, in 1861, had the answer to every household question you could possibly want to ask, whether it be headaches or how you wanted to make a dumpling using just the right amount of animal fats or whatever it was all in here it's a gigantic book and it has pictures and advice and how to be a good wife and everything it's all in here so yeah i think you had that and you checked it and then after that we can do whereas now i think at any time anybody says a thing one of the positions that people take up is yeah whatever because i know i can find somebody else who will tell me the thing i already want to believe because that's the other thing about abundance, right? Like, regardless of what it is you wish to believe, you can find somebody who will support it. I have okay. grapes in my backyard, and they're cuttings from my great grandfather's grapes. And I was taught as I was growing up, and for the last 40 years, you prune the grapes in February, and then you let them go for the year. And like three years ago, I had a problem with um, with a pest that was boring into the grapes. And the way to fix it is you cut that part out and you burn it. So I did that and I got more grapes. So I now prune them in February and June because I get more grapes that way. And my grandfather can't complain because he's dead. 
I didn't look that up anywhere. I didn't ever, it never occurred to me to question that wisdom. This is what you do. But, you know, we're reaching that age where we ask those questions. Which is a positive flip side to all this. You know, now Mm -hmm. we can get more grapes. And whether someone's like making uninformed opinions or over-informed or selectively informed, there is more out there, which has the potential for good. It just seems like a modern literacy or skill is is the filtering and different people are going to come to different answers, but totally. there are positive potentials in all this. Yes. Mm. Absolutely. Definitely. But this is not the positive potential chapter. Okay. You're skipping ahead. Jeff. Oh, I'm concerned then. I'm concerned about all this. <laughs> uh, it so goes against your nature too, to spend a whole chapter on concerning things. It's painful. Yeah, I think, and I mean, it's funny you say that too, because the, I mean, we've talked about this before, but I moved the chapters around like 17 times and that like holding the negativity is not my normal space either. Uh, that's John's business. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, but the, the whole commitment to writing this book was to try to actually have it as a long form conversation, like have it long enough that somebody who has not come across this conversation before can actually sort of work through the weird stories and, and sort of get a sense of what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. Here I am going back to the negatives. Maybe it is good that I'm kind of leaving this conversation, <laughs> not, <laughs> not Jeff, but uh, I did pull a, a, a quote that I think is appropriate for what we're talking about. Um, and it's on page 59 for those that are following along um, that lacking knowledge to maintain uncertainty, we default to certainty. And that kind of gets back to what I was saying about persistence. It's like, it's just easier, you know, <laughs> let's, Let's see, even if we're not right, let's just, let's just do something. Um, and so you had an example, if you, I don't know, do you recall your example in the book, your SNL uh, skit example? You want oh, to- the, should I chime in on this? Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a game show, uh, in the 2015 maybe. Um, and all you have to do to win the game show is say no. And the way the game show goes is they present a, a topical issue that is deep and profound and is probably something that you need to be contextually understanding of that situation to be able to make comment about. And the question of the game show and the name of the game show is, should I chime in on this? And inevitably, the game show host goes, should you chime in on this? And if you say no, you win. And inevitably, nobody can say no. Because everybody feels That's that once the question's been asked of them, there's some belief that you should have an answer. Right. And that, again, 70 years ago, I'll keep using different numbers. There were only so many of those topics to be asked about. And one of the things that's also increased abundantly is the number of things that we're expected to have an opinion upon. And increasingly different all the time. Right. So if you look at um, a friend of mine does uh, Chinese um, Middle Eastern relations. That topic is fairly obscure, and it's fairly, but if somebody asks people about it, they're going to be like, oh, I think that's bad. And we've tried it. Like, it ends up working out that way. People just feel the need to say something about it. Um, but for the things that are coming up every day that are that, that change through it. So if you look at, I was at a session, a three-hour session today, and looking at removing barriers for trans kids in uh, as K-12 teachers here in Canada. Um, and that's a topic that the people in the room were struggling with because they had done their training like four years ago and the language has changed since then. And the expectations are different than they were four years ago. And they're wanting to have the opinion they had four years ago and they want it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I totally understand where they're coming from because they want to be settled on an issue and then give their opinion on that issue and not have to leave that space because it's hard to hold open that space of nuance for, you know, 1400 issues. And I think also this ties back to, again, bringing in some of the things we talked before, um, especially when you're, you're trying to either hold yourself to some level of expertise, um, being, being comfortable saying, I don't know. We need, this is something I need to look into. I think we used example, examples of going to a doctor. And yeah. I think, for, again, tying it back to education, there is this perception historically that the teacher has the answer. And so 
this there, you know, there shouldn't be struggle at the teacher level, right? Like um, if I ask the teacher a question that there should be an answer. And yeah. so I think it could, for me anyway, a lot of this comes, I keep using the word persistence and getting folks comfortable with decision-making and the uncertainty that comes with the decision-making and all the things that you described, like the literacies associated with finding information, those types yeah. of things. I think for, my, for educators, that's going to be our biggest challenge. Um, yeah. And just to add on to that, like 20 years ago, we were talking about the transition from sage on the stage to guide on the side or whatever mm -hmm. terms we came up with. How does all of what Jen's talking about affect the teacher role? Yeah, and I mean, that 80 years ago, we we're talking about it too, right? Like it's that, that sort of shift from uh, content dominance to sort of literacy dominance or however you want to talk about it. Um, student-centered versus teacher-centered or, or whatever. We've been doing it for a long time. I think, well, I, I did a talk to a bunch of teachers yesterday and what I was telling them is that what you need to do is demonstrate your expertise. Um, so we're talking about using um, how to search, but doing it as a live activity in the class instead of sending kids out to do research and then go through that research and present their results in a paper. What you need to do is have them go out and search something in your class, put their search question in, put their results in, pull that up on the board and then walk through it so you can demonstrate what expertise looks like when you're actually going through their questions and responses, pulling up websites and going, oh yeah, no, this is, I can tell by looking at this on this website that this person isn't whatever, or having going, oh, you found this piece of research that says this, let's find out who that author is. And they're like, what does it matter? Like, it actually matters. If you're trying to come to understand the research, it's not about just finding a fact, it's about understanding the context. So I think that sort of say the, the guide on the side business, I would put the guide on the stage, I guess. To and the expertise mm -hmm. doesn't just mean metaphor. knowledge of subject matter. It means filtering ability and knowledge of how to seek totally reliable answers. Yeah. And that's an interesting concept to do that in front of students where you're just talking through your thinking and doing that while they're watching mm -hmm. which is something we don't normally do it's exposing um it's, it's hard to first... modeling i think so and again i, I mean mm -hmm. information filtering is so much of what we do now um and, and i want students to i want them to sort of have that sense where they do one piece of research and find that this part is true and then find another piece and see that it's the opposite is also true. And they're like, well, how do we decide? And I'm, that's where I want to be. I want to be with them at that point where they're like, how am I supposed to decide? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but why don't you keep following that through and we'll see if I can find you some other pieces and let's do another search and let's think about this a different way. And then sometimes realize that uh, there's no right decision or that we found that there actually is a great one, right? But it depends on, on what you're looking at and, and what you need to do with it. Um, so for, for me, when I'm now on LinkedIn or you're on Facebook groups and, and conversations about AI, a lot of the conversations <laughs> have the group saying, uh, tell me about the best um, AI detector that I can use <laughs> because mm -hmm. I want to continue using the same assignments I've used. And then the other half of the group is like, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're kind of getting into a conversation like we're having. We're going to use AI because it's a thing. And it's a, a thing that everybody's going to ha have access to or has access to in, in most, of, uh, especially U.S. classrooms. You can find it on your phone or whatever. And so how do you, you know, model those? And so those are the conversations I think are so interesting. So have you or in, in you're talking about this come across any individuals or any folks that are doing some interesting work in, in this regard that are thinking about how assignments will be changed or even how it's the curriculum will be adapted. It's literally what I did yesterday. Um, so the first three slides of my presentation yesterday were a picture of Tenzing Norgay and Emin Hillary. Um, and they had just, just after they went up Everest and we talked about what it meant and what was involved in that and what like the feeling of facing the unknown and what was that thing all about. And also I keep pushing how cool Tenzing Norgay is. And we had this whole conversation. And then I showed them a picture of what the top of Everest looks like today, where you've got a long line of 500 people who are waiting in line to go the next step up the lane to get their picture on the top of Everest because there are literally 500 people in line waiting to get to the top. And I don't mean like in line, like stretched out. I mean, in like line, like group three wide. 
And just because you're doing the same thing doesn't mean you're doing the same thing was the sort of, and I think that's, that's the message that, that I know lots of people have that they're passing around right now. I did a really great act, a really great activity at Plymouth. Um, Robin DeRosa and Martha Burtis were doing a, an activity a month ago where they had a group of teachers going out and doing research on a given topic. I think they were doing space junk or something um, and had them doing it in five different search spaces and testing out different ways of doing it, testing out different kinds of responses and working with academics and trying to get a sense of how these tools are responding, what kind of biases are involved and how you can draw from that. Um, so there's a lot of people doing that right now. Um, it's just, it's really, I mean, higher ed in North America is mostly taught by sessionals, right? It's mostly taught by people who, adjuncts, um, people who uh, don't have secure positions. And a K-12 system is mostly taught by teachers who don't control their curriculum. So it's really tough to make these kinds of changes inside the system if you don't have job security or you don't have access to actually do the changes. So I think there's lots of people talking about it. But if you talk to somebody in the K-12 system and say, I want you to stop doing essays because they're a waste of time anyway, they're going to say, they're going to have to write essays when they get to university and I got to teach them how to do it now. And they're not wrong. Um, hey, John, so you're a person in the K-12 system. Everybody's kind of trapped. Are you feeling trapped? <laughs> uh, our teachers definitely are. Right. Be, the joy that we, we before we recorded, we were talking about it's the last day of school in my in my schools and real tears among students, not just at the primary level, not just at kindergarten or first grade, but like fourth grade, fifth grade teachers and students crying because it's the last day of school and they're losing those relationships. And that's something that, that doesn't necessarily persist. Um, I think as the students get older and get into especially into high school, the the focus shifts from taking care of people and focusing on students first and content second to disseminating content in ways that students are expected to encounter in higher education. So preparing them for college, um, regardless of whether they're actually going to college. Um, so, you know, we do final exams, right? Final exams are a really bad idea because, you know, one thing every kid in America knows how to do is take tests. We don't need to do more of that. <laughs> um, but yet here we are giving them these huge summative high stakes exams that have, you know, this enormous impact on their grade, which is the primary motivator for students because we have to rely on extrinsic motivation because the content, which we don't have a lot of control over, isn't intrinsically motivating. I mean, it, they do feel trapped because they can't do the things that they know are good for kids. Okay, I'm concerned. Chapter goal accomplished. <laughs> you, Jeff, do you have um, the, the things, the subjects you're teaching? Is AI influencing um, what you're seeing? Sure, it's involved. And I have embraced the fact that I'm teaching mostly writing courses this semester, and I use AI for my writing, and they're going to use AI for their writing. So we do both. There is unassisted, like there, most of their assignments now they have to do an unassisted draft and then an optimized draft. And they can use whatever tools they want. And they have to have a statement of academic integrity that tells me what they did. Mm -hmm. And I have baselines of their writing ability so I can know or have a sense when draft one is not their writing. Um, that's so, and, and that's yeah. kind of where we are around AI as well. Um, we acknowledge that AI exists and our students are going to use it, whether we want them to or not, and or whether we tell them they can or can't. And so just being upfront about what's okay and what's not okay. And that changes based on the class that you're in, on the age of the student, on the instructional objectives, on the assignment, you know, and really trying to have some of those conversations with teachers about think ahead of time about what's okay and what's not okay. And there's the black and white, the, you know, student writes everything by themselves is okay. And AI does the entire project is probably not okay. But there's all these things in the middle where, Maybe I use AI to help with the research and I write the actual essay, or maybe I create an outline and say, put this into words and then I mod uh, modify it and revise it after that. Um, or maybe I write the whole thing and say to AI, make this look less like a text conversation and more like an academic paper and it cleans it up. Which of those are okay and under what conditions? And so 
those are some of the conversations we're trying to encourage our teachers to have. But in terms of plugging it into a tool and saying, you know, detect whether this is AI, it's not going to work. And it's certainly not going to work. Like I can appeal to math teachers really well because I can say, okay, it's 90% effective. Great. 90% effective in a class of 25 kids means, you know, 0.9 to the 25th power that you're going to get them all correct, which is, which is pretty low. You know, you're definitely going to be penalizing kids for using AI when they're not. And, you know, if the stakes are, are really high, if it's part of your exam grade or it's part of your, you know, your semester grade, it's not worth it. So use those in cases where you're doing formative assessments. You know, I asked a room of 100 writing teachers yesterday um, what they assigned essays for. And nobody said to teach kids how to write long form. Um, one person said to learn APA and we laughed at them, but I think, they, <laughs> um, I think they were just taunting me, but I'm not sure. Uh, but they were like to learn how to research things so they can find the answer to things, to be able to pull together different ideas, to be able to do deeper thinking, they'd be able to do, they listed all these things and none of them were about writing an essay so they could be essay writers when they get older. And I think that's where we're at with all these things is we need to ask ourselves what these skills actually are. And I think research skills are super, super, super important. And I think if you go out and do a bunch of research skills and pull together a result from that and get somebody to write up the things that you've come to terms with, I'm cool with that, right? As long as you've done the thing that I think is important for you to have done. Um, and unfortunately, we associate that with the product. And now anybody can make a product. And circling back to what you said earlier, um, certainly I fall in the category of adjunct. I, I teach at University of New Mexico and then University of uh, Virginia and I don't even know what my um, flexibility is to change assignments. So, um, you know, I can tweak things, but we, we have papers due. I can't, and we have discussion boards and things like that, which a discussion board is just completely obsolete. Now, if you're following the same, you know, write a post and reply to two other students, you know, that's, that's just an AI cut and paste. And I don't know what value that brings to anybody. Um, so all those assignments, in my opinion, need to be, be looked at the way you're doing it, Jeff, with, um, you know, using, I think I used the first week we had, we're on here, like using AI as like a study buddy and then having the transparency and talking and about I've, like I've how you're using the, it. I've tweaked the prompt. Like, you know, I, if I'm editing or giving feedback based on writing mechanics, you know, I have all my correction codes and, and I give them feedback. I've tweaked a prompt so that it's pretty close to what I would give. So then I question, what's my role? Like, it saves me a lot of time. And certainly some students use it and some students don't. They can do that on their own for the most part now. So I can focus more on content um, and other feedback rather than, you know, okay, subject verb agreement or, or whatever else. Um, and I think like in terms of assessment, the PhD dissertation defense seems like a good model. Like, you know, do you know this? Prove it <laughs> in front of a, a panel that that knows something about it. I think that um, becomes then the, the problem, the challenge is, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, with all of this online stuff, we can have classes of 75 students or 95 or whatever the number is. <laughs> and then who's got the time to do all of those type the things that you're saying might that be a role for a human yeah but which is sort of what snhu has done a lot um they've sort of pioneered the online learning for the last couple of decades and it's all like competency based mm -hmm. so basically mm -hmm. the materials mm -hmm. are there and at the end of the semester you just have to prove that you can do what you need to do if it's an accounting course prove that you can do this if it's a philosophy course prove that you have mastered whatever no. Okay, I think Which we're is way fine, out. as long as the education system is there to train those people who are prepared to learn. Yes, and I'm concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got the memo. <laughs> you got the memo. Well, and then, yeah, John, I think you were kind of alluding to some of this, too, when you're saying maybe getting ready for... Um, higher education, also teaching to a test, right? Like, unfortunately, we still have admissions and things like that. And people have to know certain, know certain facts or whatever. That's still a 
part of the system that we're running up against. ACT too. scores mm -hmm. got to get, you know, got to be in the thirties, right? Cause you got to get the scholarship money and get into those good schools. And are all those standardized tests school. still multiple choice for the most part? Yeah. And uh, some of the Ivy leagues are going back to them. <clears throat> yeah. More concerns. Yep. I appreciate the concern on your face, Jeff. Jeff, do you want to, do you want to take a pause and like, let's talk about some more positive things we can, if you want, we can just take a quick pause. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I'd love to talk about something negative. Uh, <laughs> Dave was talking about uh, how, you know, the book binding sources of truth and how, when you put it in a book, it has a certain authority, but that as soon as you publish it, it's wrong. It mm -hmm. gets out of date. What's wrong with learning in a time of abundance so far? It's been months since it's been published. <laughs> it's been the writing was finished a year and a half ago. I have a list. <laughs> uh, I think there are some. Actually, it's funny you say that. Um, this article I'm actually leaning on right now. Um, I would have put in to that book. Um, now it's from 1958. So it's not because it's not, it's too new. It's because I just had never seen it before uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it talks about how apparently, and I did not know this, apparently all this sort of right answer problem solving stuff comes out of people's attempts to mimic the processes of early computers. So in this article, uh, Herbert Simon and Alan Newell, who are like the foundation of problem solving and education, um, were working with the Rand Corporation on the Rand Joniac computer and said, the digital computers, it says digital computers, 1958, the digital computers have this whole other way of problem solving that we've learned from them. And now we're modeling our processes by looking at that model and copying it. Go ahead, John, say what's on your face. Okay. Um, well, first, it, it amazes me that it's not in Audrey's book because Audrey Waters wrote a book called Teaching Machines. Yep. And I don't remember, it's been a while, but I don't remember seeing in there that the presence of the machines would change the education that they're trying to implement. But it also reminds me of data driven decision making, right? Because we drive our instructional Maybe. goals based on the data because we want to improve schools and to improve schools we have to improve the way schools are measured and to improve that we have to improve you know the things that they measure and so we end up valuing the things that are easy to measure instead of the things that are important and so when you go too far toward data-driven decision making and creating your goals based on test scores and state report cards and and all of those kinds of things then you abandon all of the stuff that you say is important and is part of your mission because you can't measure them. So what existed before that? And should we go back to the 1940s model? Apprenticeships. Uh, yes. And, and these guys, what they were fighting against was intuition. What they particularly hated was intuition. That sense of um, like, I figured it out. I've looked at the problem and this is my intuition and we're going to try it. So they were looking mm -hmm. for a much more sort of observable, repeatable approach to problem solving. So is um, intuition the same thing as innovation and problem solving and creativity? I don't know. I don't know. You're the expert. Nope. No. He he had he wrote a whole book that says he's allowed to say he doesn't know. He's allowed to say it. He's given I, I don't think it is. Part permission. of that uncertainty I, thing. I think intuition is an excuse to believe whatever I want to believe. I think it can be. I think it can also be an expression of expertise. Um, so I think that if I look at a problem and something I've been working on for 20 years, like I finally almost starting to get there with with building things where I'll look at it and go, I think I know what's wrong with that. And I'll go and look at it. And I'm like, yeah, that's what it was. I've just I've seen it enough. Right. There's enough there. I've seen enough variables and enough different circumstances that I get kind of an intuition about what to do about it. And I can go and do something about it. And once you prove it, once you do it and it works, then you've proved that your intuition is worthwhile. If there was only one answer and th th that's the thing, like I look at the answer that I did. So like I fixed the thing that I built out back. I built a little um, squirrel resistant vegetable garden in the backyard. Um, and when I found one of the problems, I did something 
it's not the right fix. It's not the it's not a fix to a problem. A uh, part of me, it's not the solution to a problem. It's a fix to a problem. So I no longer have that problem anymore. There are probably much better ways of doing it. The one that I chose is not necessarily the right one, but my intuition was that this would allow me to get away from the problem I was having. Whereas what these guys are talking about is that if you give enough details into a computer, if you give it enough information, it will always get the right answer. It's not like you'd rather have Scotty or Jordy LaForge fixing things <laughs> than the Starfleet <laughs> manual. All right. Can I can I switch gears on us? Please do. Okay. Well, this is kind of my last segment, Shanka. And I'm not even sure how it really ties into what we're <laughs> saying because I don't remember how Jeff or uh, Dave did the segue. But this whole idea of the um, um, impact on communities and people. And you had some really good examples um, of, I think you had the example, if you were mad at, I think it was a, a ball player or whatever, you'd like shake your fist at the TV. <laughs> well, now, like, you know, and we can also, like, we if you didn't like swarm dinner. and... Yeah, you didn't. If you didn't enjoy the dinner you just had, you could stop and grab some food on the way home or whatever else. But now it gets. And again, actually, that is one of the things that's changed a little bit, Jeff. Is that uh, there's not as much posting, um, live posting, as there was even a few years ago. In the last, really since COVID, I think we've got a lot less live posting going on. It's much more stylized. The postings that you do see, like there's a lot more run up to something getting posted. There's more of the so as Instagram became Snapchat, if you know what I mean, like um, the kids used to post on Insta in a way that the posts um, persisted. And now they use the the one where it goes away. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that we've had this movement to the Snapchatification of social media, which is not actually reflected in the book. Yeah. And I do think that runs up against what we we're just saying. If we're saying problems now, you know, we've got more information, we need to spend more time chewing on it we need to say what we don't know mm. we have to have persistence things need to take longer yeah we're running up against a culture where you know you don't want to put yourself out there for fear especially and we've talked about this historically we've said you know i blogged all through college sean yes you said was it on an interview you said like a board member was like i hear you blog like what's that <laughs> all about <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think that it's kind of fun. We all had the, got together really because we thought of the cool potential of being able to create communities around things to talk about and try things and look dumb and <laughs> whatever. Um, but yeah, I think that, that, I think that's an interesting, so why did you put that in this book, in this part of the book? Like I, cause, cause I, this is to me kind of hangs out there a little bit, unless it's like you said, you were just trying to chunk the negative implications all in, all in a chapter. But it was. It seemed to pivot to me a bit. I'm um, talking more about the personal it's a good aspects. question. I would have to go over that. I'd have to read back over the section to try to figure out why it was exactly there. Um, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, maybe it's because I'm a distracted loon and I don't know where to put the ideas together properly. <laughs> but John I mean, let you keep thing. it there, so yeah, John did yeah. allow me to keep it there. Yeah, so John, why did you yeah. let him keep it there? Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think there's something really important about understanding how much more abundance allows what we're done to be seen. And one of the other examples I think I used was about um, in residence that I used the residence example too, because I've used that elsewhere um, where I used to teach kids that um, every time you post that you've gone out with your three friends on your floor, you've posted to the rest of the friends on your floor that you didn't go out with them. Didn't go with them. Um, and that didn't used to be the case, right? You didn't, you may have taken a picture when you went out together, but that picture was four weeks from coming back from the, from the photo booth, for those of you who don't know, you just have to take film from cameras and, <laughs> and get the pictures back. So there was no like direct response. Um, the closest you could get from a direct response of what actually happened was Jeff's website in Pusan, um, where he would take party pictures of parties that happened and then you'd be in trouble for having it. And get problem. emails from people's parents saying, I'm so happy to see Johnny. I haven't seen him in so long. Why is he always drinking? <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And that's Jeff using abundance um, because but, he used to... oh. But the important part of that is the exclusionary thing because everybody knows that they weren't invited and that that's new now. And I don't, I, I can understand how I might not have woven that in right, but to me, it's one of those things that is a part of abundance that we don't always notice. So same as, you know, you're shouting at the guy on TV, except now you're tweeting at him and now you're messaging at him. And that, that rage that you had is now 
increasing other people's rage and gives them something to jump off from. Um, you know, John uh, Stewart did a piece last week talking about how, you know, it's all about clicks and, you know, that, that rage culture and the sort of, I'm, I'm furious at you culture and all the rest of that business is just about monetary clicks. And unfortunately we're all learning from it, but that's how we're supposed to engage with each other. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, if you, you look at a newspaper from 40 years ago, it had its shortcomings, but there was none of that, like, get it on the, on the cover, maybe like the lead. People weren't making a decision on whether to buy the newspaper based on every single article on every single page. Yeah. It wasn't, it was, you're buying the newspaper or not. And that's determined on the top two inches on the front page. That's and you right. had one or that, two it's just tell the story from. Yeah. Well, plus I, you, I, you you put yourself out there as the target. So if you're you're setting yourself out there as an expert, and then someone decides they don't like your ideas, they don't like you, then they just take you down. So like, why would you put yourself out? You know, why why bother? Why? And I think you had a couple examples of something kind of close to that, but I don't exactly remember if it was this chapter. But um, but it kind of gets to the point too, like expertise and who are our experts and who's going to want that? Who's going to want that baggage of um, um, like I said, putting yourself out there just to be taken down. And and to to make the education pivot again, what does it mean for us to train people to find expertise in fields they're not experts in? So, and that to me is the question that I never figured out how to frame it properly when I get a chance to ask it. Um, but we have, uh, you know, if there are 30 million, 37 million people in Canada, 36 and a half million of them are not scientists. Um, but the vast majority of them have had to make at least one science decision in their lives. And if you're going to make a science decision, how would you do it? Right. How do you go about choosing a scientific expert to believe? How do you go about trying to weave through it? Cause you should not be reading the articles cause you're not going to understand them. Right. So how do you choose? But we don't teach that. We teach you the preparation for being a scientist. So that later on, you'll know enough to be able to judge between them, but we never get there. All right, uh, I have a now. few thoughts to share and I'm worried yeah. I'm going to forget them. Okay, uh, Sam, quick. Okay. First one is that 1990s abundance was uh, 320 by 240 pixels and it was dazzling at the time. Um, as far as the ephemeral nature of social media these days, yeah, they post stories more than post, but I can go to Instagram now and find a million live streams and... There are all these connections and communities. And and this chapter, I think, is the first time I saw community is the curriculum uh, explicitly stated. And you make the point that community has always been the curriculum. Mm -hmm. It used to be, you know, your small town and the people that you trusted. Isn't that still how we make decisions? The community is much bigger. We have micro, not micro, but, mini, you know, sub communities and overlapping communities. But just like in the old days, we trusted Mildred's cookie recipe more than Martha's, don't we still have our online Mildred's that we trust more than our Martha's? Apologies. I have to online Mildred's and Martha's to make decisions about uh, carpentry things, because I do enough of it. I have online Mildred's and Martha's for education, for technology, uh, for cooking in some places. So I, I gave the, the mm -hmm. um, what's his face's? The guys at the Kenji, yeah, Kenji, um, from um, different cooking websites and stuff. So I have it for that. I don't have it for the example I used last time about um, using a heat pump. Do you do you trust Mil Mildred's cooking or carpentry website more than Martha's because Mildred is a better chef or a better carpenter or because she has better SEO? Her cookies taste better. I think, I or she like can, it. or she can game the algorithm so her things pop up. At I the think top it's of the because list. I've had some success making her cookies. Okay, right. So I think it's because I do enough of that to have been able to evaluate the thing that you're giving me to get a sense that there's something reliable about it. Right, and again, I have those for a very small nature of things. So again, right now I'm trying to decide whether or not uh, we put solar panels on the house. 
Mm -hmm. And if we put solar panels on the house, I probably need to add a 200 amp breaker in the house. And then we'll be looking towards getting an electric car. And I'm trying to find out right now whether or not it actually makes sense to think about charging an electric car with the solar panels on your house. Does that actually happen? Or am I just sort of thinking about a thing I don't understand? And I can't seem to mix my words in such a way to find a group of people who I reliably believe to make those kinds of huge financial decisions, but also fitting in with the environmental ethic that I'm trying to develop as a person. Have you asked right. AI? It'll answer whichever way you want to ask it. Right. So if you ask it, if it's possible, it'll say yes. If you ask it, if it's not possible, it'll say no. Can't you ask it in a more neutral way? Then it's going to answer you at random. Because it's just pulling from Reddit. It's the same people. Mm, can't you specify? Or it's going to pull only... from the sales companies, the people who are selling say, solar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, you guys are so skeptical. The, the thing I'm is concerned the thing about your skepticism. AI doesn't help you with the internet because all it's doing is reproducing the internet. Right? So if you're asking AI about things that are generally settled, it's fine because it's going to give you the generally settled answer. If you're Can't asking you say it about, only use sources of this nature or caliber only like sometimes when i do I my searches i say sources where i wouldn't need to do this well you can ask them give me the Who? sources but show I'm me the verified the sources that have research that are It'll related to up. using mm, it's gotten better it has gotten better actually so if you use scholar gpt for instance right now if you switch to scholar gpt when i tried it for stuff that i knew every one of the references was accurate they were real ones Mm -hmm. the, the problem is, Jeff, is that it only works if I can verify it myself. I need to be able to tell it which I couldn't even tell you which um, sources on solar a person should listen to. I don't know. That's my problem. I don't know. And I'm I'm like you. Jen has made the same comment five times. And I don't think any of us, certainly not me, has responded to her. She's quite right. I have more persistence than the average bear. Like when I get on to something. I hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it. I'm relentless with it. And I still have not managed to crack this. Now, and again, it's not like, it's not like this is what I do all day. It's that for the last year and a half, every few weeks I go, eh, I'm going to go try that again. Hoping Why to Why is prepare. it so hard? Like, you know, the cost of what solar panel, what it would cost you to generate a certain amount of solar power energy. Mm -hmm. You know, the cost of alternative sources of fueling your electric car. Mm -hmm. Why is it so hard? You don't know how long the solar panels are going to last. You don't know how long um, what maintenance range. they're going to need. No, I don't you, think you so because they haven't been around long enough to have real data there. You don't know what the weather in Windsor is going to, you know, sunlight, whether that makes sense or whether their calculations are based on, oh, you're living in Tennessee or you're living in Georgia or you're living I'll give you one wherever. piece of news. There's a new sort of thread through the community that says you're actually better having the solar panels on the southwest side of your house rather than the south side because you get better quality sun during that part of the day that's one of ten thousand things right and because i have access to all of the if i didn't have access to all the information i'd have a book in my house that said all about solar panels and i would have read it and i would have it just seems made like the you know to a certain extent the information just isn't out there so mildred wouldn't have known either she would have said i don't know have some mm -hmm. cookies the Google algorithm is so bad now. Did you ask Mrs. Beaton about solar panels? Should have. <laughs> Should have. Uh, and then it's like solar tiles and there's like all this business. And I'm not saying, Jeff, that if I like buckle down and this is all I did, I'm sure I'd be able to eventually figure it out. But it's one of the things that's just on my list. Right. And this is, is it, the problem. Can you not figure it out because the information is not out there yet or you can't find the information? Both. It's that there is not the information. It's that there is an abundance of information and it's all contradictory. So some people will tell you that that's dumb. And some people will tell you, obviously, that's what you should do and everything in between. You just described Reddit. In I did describe <laughs> it. <laughs> this is the thing. Right. Yeah. And so I and I am like ostensibly I have some idea of how to use these tools. I have some idea how to do a, a, a search. I'm certainly better at it than my kid. <laughs> oh, oh my god! Oh my god! Ouch. I can't find anything on the Google machine about it. Did you put any words in? Oh, never thought to do that.
just might ask those that have children or with the younger the younger folk how i think it came out a couple topics ago or a topic and a half ago um being able to see through the bs like are they better at it or worse and i because i'm looking at like the senior citizen set and they are great at it it's just being able to tell if it's on the internet like that that's it's on the internet so that's right like how does that i don't think there's a group that's any good at it are they, they any diff- better they at have it? different biases they trust different things than their grandparents do, but they're still, I think we all have blind spots. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly yeah. they value authenticity, but you know, what does that mean? Can practice to authenticity yeah. Really well. <laughs> yeah. I'm the only one who's waiting for Jeff to send me the link to the article that explains the thing about the solar panels right now. Stay tuned. I'm going to put that in the show notes. <laughs> that will be in the show notes. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think just, that's that ties in that whole idea like the BS meters. Like, is that another role for the educators is to like help people yeah. go? Like, yeah, this person's out here trained. to sell you a solar, they're out here to sell you a solar panel. They don't care whether it actually will be around in 20 years when you're it's not how they're trained, right? Could you they're develop trained. a training course for that, Dave? I have BS detection. What's that? BS Bullshit. detection course. Oh, well, there's actually you can just look at uh Howard's um what's his name? Crap detector. Um Howard uh, Rheingold there's a whole thing about crap detection yeah he's it's really good actually there's some really good stuff there um crap how you spell crap <laughs> so well, it I seems think... to me so I know we're concerned there's a lot of concerns yes and, and... there's a lot of concerns but I feel like I'm a, I have to admit, I'm a little bit encouraged because I feel like there's a role for humans in oh, crap detection, yeah. in, you know, filtering, in yep. expertise analysis. Should. All around the word should is where I think the, the human part comes in. And that's what was I telling you guys about the poor people, the students who were asking me about how they're ever going to fit in the job market now that Jenna is there. Did I tell you guys that story? Hmm. Oh. So I was doing a talk for... Um, the social psych graduate students on my campus. And, uh, you know, it was my normal tour sadness stuff. Um, and one of the kids at the end goes, they asked questions. And the first question was, so I'm going into, the, you know, I'm going into this workforce. Like in 10 years, how am I ever supposed to argue with somebody and say that my skills are actually worthwhile? They can just get this stuff from AI. And I was like, good question. Um, and the question is, the answer to me is, is that a human can deal with shoulds. And the AI can give you an answer, which may or may not be applicable to your the context of your situation, right? So they can deal with complexity. They can deal with wicked problems, frame it how you will. Um, and they can sort of consider the nuance of a situation in a way that a system can only respond to the inputs you gave it. They should become solar panel experts. Right? <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> I'm not joking, Jeff. A, a Look, if you find answer, I'll be very happy about it. But I just, it is one of those things where I just get lost in the abundance of it, where you're just all over the place and there's so much information and so much of it is commercial. Uh, I don't and know. then you end up at, at the end of it saying, yes, you can make a tiny little contribution to making the environment better, but you have to give your money to Elon. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. There's all those sort of intersections, right? Um, yeah, it's a problem. Anyway, so it's hard because I don't even know how that we've ever taught anybody how to make that argument that the thing I'm good at is not solving your problems, but telling you if you should solve them. Isn't that what you and we've been doing for 20 years? We've been saying it, but I don't think anybody was listening. <laughs> well, not our fault. We need to be better at marketing. Maybe we should learn some marketing skills. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's the same thing that that sort of uh, progressive education has been saying for 200 years, right? That it's about how learning kids how to make meaning, teaching them how to make meaning, right? And then guys like Daniel Willingham will say, well, it won't help them be better problem solvers. And I'm like, don't care. Especially now. Now it's easy to say don't care. I'm like, I got Gen AI. What do I need a problem solver for? 
Well, apparently you do. Apparently I do. Yeah, that's true. So got to solve the problem of getting a job. Well, that is a problem I'm going to be having this year. So I got that exact problem. There you go. Right. Who knows? Maybe I'll be able to research. Yeah, this was our conversation at dinner with my family on uh, Saturday night. We were going around the table. <laughs> we were like, yeah, my job's going to be gone. Yeah, yeah, my job's fundamentally going to change. <laughs> and then when I, this week I got my hair cut and my, my the woman who cut my hair, she goes, it's going to be a long time before my job is really impacted by AI. And I'm like, you're probably right. It's oh, probably okay. true. Yeah, I think you're okay. That's a tough one. Yeah, I don't, uh, less at risk than some others, I think. Well, that was the extent of my questions. I don't know. Do you guys have any uh, any other questions? Apparently, this is at least partially an education problem. Is that what we're talking about? My question, that is the next chapter. My question is, which words should be stressed? This is at least partially an education problem, or this is at least partially an education problem, or this is at least partially an education problem. How should we read this chapter? Are you saying we have to tune in next week to get the answer to that question? Great in. cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> or whenever the next time we do this is. I'm not sure we have a date yet. All right. So uh, give that uh, post show. stay tuned to the post show for discussion of that and other things. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in once again. Uh, this content is not ephemeral. It will be published and show noted. And uh, there might be some information about solar panels. Uh, so we'll see you next time. <laughs> Jen, did you say you teach at UNM? University of North Carolina.